BPLA, I think uh, it's seven o'clock, and so we are um, going to get started with the webinar. Tonight's webinar is Using the Digital Public Library of America for Teaching and Learning. Uh, again, I'm Frankie Abbott, the uh, Education Project Manager at the DPLA, and I'm joined by uh, two lovely co-presenters tonight from our Education Advisory Committee, uh, Dina Barnett from Ripley High School in Ripley, West Virginia, and Melissa Strong from Northeastern State University. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with GoToWebinar, uh, you probably now have logged on and see that there is uh, a GoToWebinar control panel on your right. In uh, the webinar setting, we generally automatically mute everybody on the call except the presenters. Uh, and take questions uh, both as we're talking and at the end of the session through the questions box. So feel free to post comments or questions for us um, as the webinar moves along. We will also be saving uh, hopefully about 10 minutes at the end of the webinar for Q&A with me and the other presenters. We are going to employ um, what I lovingly referred to to Adina and Melissa as the peanut butter and jelly presentation strategy, wherein I'm going to talk a little bit about some basics, um, what the DPLA is, uh, what we're doing for education. Then you're going to hear um, perspectives from Adina and Melissa. Adina is a high school history teacher and Melissa uh, a college uh, English professor. And then I'm going to finish the webinar uh, just giving a little bit of an overview of some of the future education work that the DPLA is going to be doing, and then we're going to take questions. So to get started, oop, um, goals for this webinar tonight. Um, by the end of this session, we're hoping that uh, you, the participants, will understand, first of all, what the DPLA is. I sense that there's actually a huge range of folks on the call, some very familiar with the project already, and some who may never have attended a DPLA education or other DPLA event before. So we'll be pretty quick here, but I hope uh, effective in explaining what the Digital Public Library of America is. Uh, second goal is uh, we hope by the end of the session you will understand how educators can use DPLA in the classroom. And finally, um, we hope you'll understand how DPLA is specifically working to support educational use. So what we're doing now what we might be doing in the future, what we could and should be doing. So to get started, um, what is the Digital Public Library of America? There are uh, lots of different definitions that you'll find on our website that have a lofty language of mission, but I think a good pretty straightforward definition is this. The Digital Public Library of America is a free national digital library that provides access to materials from libraries, archives, and museums from across the United States. Emphasis there on the word free. The Digital Public Library of America is a nonprofit organization um, and is in the business of providing access. So um, the content that we collect is archival material from libraries, archives, and museums, and we work with a group currently of 1,600 partners from across the United States. A second way to think about um, what the DPLA is is that it is a network of partners uh, who make their content available through a single website. So a national digital library, um, very differently than, say, an organization like the Library of Congress, which is a brick and mortar place with collections that they've digitized and put online, the DPLA is instead a network of people who decided um, to make the content that they've digitized available in one place through the DPLA, as well as uh, continuing to offer it through their own websites. Or if, like me, uh, you enjoy a really, really simple definition, uh, Underneath the uh, fabulous folklore map on the right, my favorite definition of what the DPLA is, is that it is one place to find digital stuff from 1,600 uh, plus institutions. So what does the DPLA offer to uh, educators? So I mentioned that the DPLA is in the business of being a one-stop shop, one place to find cultural heritage content. And what that means uh, from an education point of view is that it is really a, a wealth of primary sources. The DPLA does also have some secondary source content, but the kinds of uh, material that uh, folks in library, archive, and museum special collections are digitizing and putting up online tends to be very rich in the primary source vein. Um, and because the DPLA works with those 1,600 institutions um, that are all American institutions, from an education point of view, the DPLA really has um, great coverage and real strengths in American history and culture. 
But it's also important to remember that uh, American institutions are not just collecting uh, items related to American history and culture. So you do find some other things in the mix, which is exciting. Um, think, for example, about the particular special collections divisions of university libraries and some of the things that they collect that have nothing to do with American history and culture specifically. You'll find that kind of content in the DPLA as well. The DPLA, I think, um, uh, offers also a sort of a different approach to primary source uh, searching. So you uh, likely are familiar with some of the fabulous projects from partners of the DPLA, the National Archives, the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, uh, all of them large federal institutions that offer great primary source materials. So the DPLA works with some um, large partners like that, and I've drawn out an equation as an example on the bottom of the slide. So the DPLA works, for example, um, of those 1,600 partners with Artstore the National Archives, um, and the Smithsonian, but we also work with state consortiums. So we work, for example, in the state in which I live, which is Massachusetts, with Digital Commonwealth. Uh, and Digital Commonwealth is an institution that, in turn, works with um, hundreds of smaller uh, and mid-sized institutions in Massachusetts, one of which, for example, is the Brockton Public Library. So I think one of the neat things from an education perspective about the DPLA is that it is really a place to find both um, national level material and also really neat local sources. The DPLA is currently working with institutions like Digital Commonwealth in 20 states, and ambitiously, we hope to have completed the map to be getting um, content from institutions in all 50 states by 2017. Um, finally, in terms of what the DPLA offers, uh, we get the question a lot, <laughs> how is the DPLA uh, different from Google? And there are many complex answers to that question. But I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind um, is that the content that you find in the DPLA has been vetted and described by information professionals. So, it is uh, content that, as part of the digitization process, has been selected, has been described, um, and has been reviewed by um, professionals in this field, and that's important to remember about what you find here. So how does the DPLA uh, work? If you are at a computer, which I imagine most of you are, I would encourage you to go on the DPLA's website, which has a kind of an unconventional URL. It is um, dp.la, so there's no .org or .com. Uh, there's an interesting story there, which I won't <laughs> tell in this session, but if you're interested, just shoot me an email. And uh, you can see um, to the right of the question, how does it work on this slide, um, the search box, which you would find on the main page of our site. The most common way uh, that people use the Digital Public Library of America and its uh, content is by keyword searching in this search bar. And you can see right above the search bar um, that there is a, a current number of items that the DPLA is offering access to from those 1,600 partners. And right now that number is just above 11 million, which is exciting. Um, for some perspective, when the DPLA launched uh, just two and a half years ago, it offered uh, access to 2.4 million items from 500 contributing institutions. Now you can see um, the DPLA is at around 11 million items from 1,600 contributing institutions, so that's exciting. And as I mentioned earlier, we are continuing our march towards completing the U.S. map um, and getting more and more content available through the website. So um, for purposes of a demonstration, uh, I'm going to show you some slides as if we are doing a, a search for items related to Lewis and Clark. So imagine that I typed Lewis and Clark uh, in the search bar. I would be taken to a search result page um, with a list of items that looks like the results on this slide. So if you start at the top left, you can see um, that this particular uh, page return results uh, in, the, in the number of 2,322. Note that I did enter Lewis and Clark in a particular way, so I used, for example, the word and instead of a symbol um, for and. Uh, on the right, you can see that there is a list um, of items returned, uh, and you can see the sort of title and description for those items, as well as a thumbnail. And then on the left, um, there is a menu for refining those search results. From an education perspective, uh, 2,322 is quite an ample number of search results, and particularly if you're thinking of using the DPLA with students. So the opportunity to refine those results is important. You can see, for purposes of demonstration, that I have refined this search uh, so that only image results are showing. But um, there are lots of ways uh, that you could refine. So by format, we, we of course work with um, all kinds of different formats. So images, uh, text formats, audio, video, as well as um, pictures of physical objects. You can refine search results by the places they come from, contributing institution. Um, you can refine by date, location, language, and subject headings, which is exciting. Uh, if we were to click on the second item, the item titled Meriwether Lewis Clark, 
we'd be taken to an item page for this particular item uh, and some descriptive information about it. So we already knew the title of the item because we saw that on the list on the previous slide. But the creator of this particular portrait is uh, Thomas M. Easterly. It was created in 1850. It comes to the DPLA from one of those state consortiums, in this case, um, an organization that calls itself Missouri Hub, which is Missouri State Group. Um, and from that state group, it's actually the Missouri History Museum, who is the uh, owner and holder of this particular item. And I picked this actually because I thought this was an interesting little fact about uh, Lewis and Clark that I did not know. But the description, which gives us useful context, tells us that this is a portrait of Meriwether Lewis Clark son of William Clark, named after his father's associate, Meriwether Lewis. So I thought it was kind of a fun fact um, that Lewis and Clark, Clark actually had a son and named him after Meriwether Lewis, and so you have a person who has sort of a Lewis and Clark specially branded name. Um, and this is, of course, also the description lets us know that this is a daguerreotype. And then further down, um, that it is an image, um, a place to go to learn more about the copyright status of this item. And then finally, if we were to click on the URL, um, listed in the final field, or view object right underneath the thumbnail, we'd be taken to the Missouri History Museum's website where we could see the original descriptive record and look at the full item in all of its glory. So that's a little bit of a sense of how the DPLA's website works um, and sort of what we offer users. I won't go too much into this, but um, just in the spirit of sharing all the, the possible sort of education inroads into the DPLA, we do offer some other ways to look at search results. Uh, on the left, you see the bookshelf, which is a way of um, allowing students to just look at book and periodical results in the DPLA. Again, I said we have a, a goodly number also of secondary sources, so that's a way of sort of filtering out those uh, text-based things. Um, also, the map at the top right uh, is a way that if you are working uh, with students, say, on a local history project, they can see um, all the items that are about a particular location using the map to drill down. And then finally, um, they can use the timeline to view a set of search results um, according to date information, which is useful uh, for those um, historians and other humanists in the crowd who are, of course, always interested in change over time. The final sort of basic thing about the DPLA worth noting is that people have used the DPLA's um, open data, so this descriptive information and thumbnails, to build new projects. Um, and there are two examples on this screen of apps that people have developed using DPLA material. So on the right, um, a, a, a neat but simple um, mobile app that can be used on a phone. Um, that is called OpenPix, and it's a way that um, users can find neat uh, image content related to the, the place that the phone locates them in. And then, as somewhat more complicated on the left, is an app called Serendipomatic. Um, this allows users to cut and paste a paragraph of text, say from a term paper that a student is writing, into a field and find um, related items, not just from the Digital Public Library of America, but also from Europeana, which is Europe's digital library, a Trove, which is Australia's digital library, and Digital NZ, which is a New Zealand's national project. So all of these um, things that I've previously described are, are really made for a sort of general research population. So they are useful um, for educator researchers looking for materials to use in the classroom, and they're also useful potentially for uh, students. But what is the DPLA specifically doing uh, for educators? Um, and at the bottom you see a URL, which is a, a place that you can go online, uh, dp.la slash education, to learn about all of the projects that I'm about to describe. I'm sure that the, the common wisdom on this call uh, is, is high in terms of understanding um, the value of primary source material for instruction. Of course, in the um, K-12 world, this is a heavily emphasized in the standards, particularly the Common Core. Primary sources are also of um, important value in a higher education context um, because primary sources across disciplines, across subjects, are a really important way of understanding contexts for events, time periods. Um, so they are really rich research material um, and an important supplement to research involving secondary sources and sometimes the main event, depending on the kind of project that you want to do. Um, primary sources are, of course, a really important form of support for inquiry-based instruction, um, which is something that is both important and a hot topic in education at various levels. And primary sources can actually be the material um, that students use in a variety of different kinds of projects, digital storytelling projects, uh, document-based questions, um, the construction of timelines for sequencing events, and other kinds of research projects. 
within the context of a uh, more traditional research paper, um, as well as in uh, collaborative, less writing-based projects. So the DPLA, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is only two and a half years old, um, and we knew uh, early on that we had a great collection of primary sources that was very unique because it is a compilation of the, really the riches from institutions across the country. Um, but we uh, collectively were a very young organization and wanted to do some research about um, what we might do for education users that would be of value. So from July 2014 to May 2015, um, we held interviews and focus groups with other cultural heritage projects, um, both some sort of state history focused ones, as well as some of the folks I mentioned earlier, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, who have been in the business of creating resources around primary sources for a long time. Um, and of course, we also met with a, a number of educators in both K-12 and higher education to ask them uh, what a project like the DPLA might usefully offer them and how we could go about it. If you're interested in reading about that research, it was funded by the Whiting Foundation, and I have put on this slide, um, I hope, an easy to write down URL, which is tinyurl.com slash DPLA education, at which you can learn more um, about <laughs> that project and read that paper, although I'll warn you that it's long and I wrote it, so I can say that about it. But major findings in the event that you don't want to go read that paper in its entirety um, were these. Uh, number one, the feedback that we got um, on, on both sort of sides of the education resource fence was that increasingly um, there was an interest in seeing resources that were usable both by students and teachers, so that the older model of creating um, giant numbers of lesson plans um, and resources that teachers had to play middleman um, in, in order for, to make them usable for students were a kind of older model that we should step away from and that we should be thinking about making collections of primary sources that students might use directly on our website. So was the first finding. The second finding was um, that we had no useful education project unless we involved a lot of educators, which again, I feel sure probably makes sense to a lot of the folks on this call. Um, but you know, for us, this was an important sort of tenant of the way that we wanted to proceed so that um, educators themselves needed to be really um, core voices in the choices that we made and also curators of the kind of primary source projects that we would make. And finally, um, from this education project, we thought a lot about the question of volume. So the fact that the DPLA has 11 million items is a great thing, except it's also totally overwhelming, um, particularly from a student perspective. And so how could we help bridge that gap where we could show off some um, source highlights that we had about particularly curricular topics, the kinds of things that we thought that students and teachers would be looking for? How could we make it a little bit easier and more efficient for them to find some of the things that we thought they would be looking for? And the answer was, to create um, some primary source sets. So we got ourselves an education advisory committee. Um, we, you'll hear from two of them in a minute, and I'm so sorry that um, Melissa Strong alphabetically did not make it onto this screenshot, but here are four of the fabulous ladies of the education advisory committee, which has ultimately 10 members um, and includes uh, educators and administrators from the world of history, um, English, language arts um, and libraries. Um, they have been really a super valuable and important crew in helping us hammer out some of the details of what a good primary source set includes. And then helping us um, pilot just about 10 days ago our very first group of primary source sets, which lives on a page on our site that hopefully is pretty easy to find. It is um, dp.la slash primary hyphen source hyphen sets. There's also a link to it from the main um, landing page of the DPLA's website. So we've put up a group of 30 sets. Um, they are about topics in American history, literature, and culture. So you can see in that, that top row already sort of the mix, um, the Road to Revolution, a more traditional uh, history set that makes a lot of use of documents, as well as um, some sets in here that are about works of literature, and then also some broader culture topics. Um, each set has 10 to 15 uh, primary sources selected and described by the curator. Um, this is, I'm going with the Lewis and Clark theme, so this is again uh, a, the set about Lewis and Clark, and I've, you can only see six of the sources, but there are in fact, I think, 12 sources in this set. There is an overview that you can see on the screenshot, so some description about the sort of who, what, when, where um, of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And then the sources, and you can see that the idea is that this page is pretty accessible to students. There are primary sources to explore without a whole lot of sort of heavy-handed analysis work about them. And then in the top right corner, um, there is a teaching guide 
that the curator wrote. This is an actual um, individual source page. What's kind of interesting to me is this is actually the most viewed source page since we launched this 10 days ago. But it's this really neat letter um, from the governor of Georgia to uh, members of the Creek Nation in 1760. You can see on the right we provided some information that would be useful in a citation credits. You can see that this comes from uh, Hargret Library uh, via the Digital Library of Georgia. There's a link back to the item in the DPLA for folks who want to see that full description. And then, because we know that students um, no longer have the exposure to cursive writing that they once did, you can see the sort of beginning of the transcription of this letter at the bottom of the screen. And finally, um, that teaching guide. This is actually, um, these are to all totally asynchronous. So this is not the teaching guide for Lewis and Clark, it's the teaching guide for the set about the Great Gatsby, um, which is neat, and you can see um, that uh, Susan Ketchum, who designed this particular site, has written um, discussion questions, which you'll find with all the sets, as well as a sort of sample classroom activity um, that could be used. These are intended to um, spark teaching creativity and not be prescriptive about the only ways to use the set. And then on the right, um, we did as a group um, design a sort of generic tool that can be used with primary source analysis in general that asks um, to give teachers some ideas about questions that they can uh, ask students about or, or skills that they can use um, to talk about primary sources that could be used with sort of any primary source, as well as links to some of these tools from other institutions that have also used them. And now I'm going to turn it over to um, the lovely Adina Barnett, who is going to talk a little bit about her experience uh, on the Education Advisory Committee and the set that she made. Good evening. Uh, like Frankie said, worked on several projects and curriculum. And then really what sparked my interest in applying to the DPLA Education Committee was the fact that um, my master's in American history and government was taught solely with primary source documents. And so this is something I believe strongly in, um, not because it's something that common courses we need to do, it's something that I believe is essential. Uh, as I tell my students, this is how we get to the root of things. Instead of a book telling us what is being said, we can go to the source and find out what is being said. Um, the other reason I was really intrigued by this is I have uh, worked with my school on literacy initiatives um, for the past three years. Uh, it was ironic that Frankie posted the Bro uh, Brockton Public Library because we actually have been using the Brockton High School model. Um, there's a lady called Sue Sackowitz. Her name's Sue Sackowitz. She's the she was the principal principal at Brockton High, and so her whole philosophy was that for literacy to be successful in the classroom, that it needed to be taught in every classroom, from shop class to social studies to science to math. And that's something that we've really embraced in our school. So not only are we working on active reading strategies, teaching kids how to circle, to highlight, to annotate, we're working on um, using those documents to speak about the, dis the documents and discuss them in the classroom. And we're also teaching the kids how to write effectively. Because not only is this important, um, you know, as a student, it's important for the rest of your life. You need to be able to talk effectively about what you've read and what you're learning about. You need to be able to write about what you're learning about. And so that's really the reason why I I had to be a part of the education um, committee and I applied um, because I believe strongly strongly in literacy and, and when I say literacy I mean literacy for every kid not just you know our advanced placement students which I do teach advanced placement at United States history and I love it but I, I wanted it for those kids that are in the middle and, and that's who I focus on my college prep kids and my technical readiness kids I want them to be reading the documents and understanding them because those are the kids who 
you may, you know may not have all the skills today to go to college, but hopefully if we're reading the documents, understanding the documents, writing about the documents, talking about the documents, then we're going to be able to um, make their lives better because they're going to be able to understand things um, when they're when they're adults in, in the real world. So um, the application process for the DPLA Education Committee um, was that Frankie sent out an all call in June of 2015 and we were asked a series of essay questions. I think there were seven or eight essay questions um, that they asked and they wanted to know how we were using primary sources already in the classroom. And so my classroom, I don't use a textbook. Um, I teach completely with primary source documents and I, I like to use a lot of technology. Um, one of the things that I really appreciated from Frankie was the fact that she wanted to put an emphasis on effective questioning and also on pro projects. I love projects. I love using projects because I think that um, projects encourage students to use higher order thinking. Um, one thing I was doing in my classroom today, you know, this is just something simple, was uh, I put up scenarios of colonists during the American Revolution, like before the, during the American Revolutionary period, and I was asking the kids, do you think the colonists is a patriot, a loyalist, or, or they're neutral? And, and then I said, and how did you come about that that decision? How did you determine that decision? And so it made the kids think about all the things that they had learned, process, synthesize all that, and then they could give an answer. Um, so I really like these sets, um, and we can even move on to the next slide. Um, and what I like about these sets is that for me, as a teacher, I don't have to go. I don't have the time to go out and reinvent the wheel um, every weekend when I sit down to write lesson plans. And I know that you all understand what I'm saying. Um, we have so much on our plates as teachers, and so what what I really love about these sets is they're they're ready to go. I don't have to come up with questions. I don't have to create a project. It's all here for me to use. So the two sets that I've written thus far that you can see, this is one of them. Um, this is entitled Jacksonian Democracy? Question mark. And I had attended a uh, Gilda Lerman seminar over the summer, and this was something that we contemplated the entire week. Was Jackson, you know, a Democrat or was he a nationalist? And so that's kind of what sparked. Uh, the the creation of this set and so thinking about this set I, I always keep my students in the in the back of my mind like I said I know that my AP students can handle the, these sets pretty easily but I want my college prep and my technical readiness kids to also be able to handle um, these sets as well and so some of the things that we thought about when we were creating these sets is not just having documents. So as you can see, um, the very first uh, document that I've used here is an engraving of Andrew Jackson. So for the kids, they need to have a picture of Andrew Jackson in their head um, before they even start, you know, thinking about what Jackson had to say. And so the second one, um, these are, I chose illustrations from the pictorial life of Andrew Jackson. Again, they're images. I'm one of those people, I'm a visual learner, and so again, we need to think about all types of learners when we're learning and, or, or we're in class. And so the second, second um, source that I've included here are images. So we're, we're thinking about what what this time period looks like, what's going on in Andrew Jackson's life even before we start reading documents. And so I've included several documents and, and the questions that we've set up to go along with the documents um, include the documents. And so I, I think that that is key because if you as a teacher want to just have the kids explore the explore the documents and then answer the questions you know on their own or with my lower students I would have them work with a partner they're able to do that um, and you could even use the questioning the questions for a class discussion you could have the 
kids each, you could divide it out. If you have 12 documents, you could give one document to each, like a pair in the class, and you could have each pair analyze the documents. Um, there's just so much, especially with the additional tools like the document analysis sheet, you can really divide this up. Instead of having every kid read every document, you can have different pairs analyzing documents and then sharing out. So it doesn't become an overwhelming task for students. Uh, so there's so many different ways that you can use this. Also with the classroom activities, uh, like Frankie said, these are just to spark your, your, your thinking. We're not saying that you have to use them, but at the same time, um, we are offering opportunities um, for more exploration. And, th and that's what I really need as a teacher. Like I said, I, we, do, we don't have enough time. We never have enough time to do the planning. Um, but what we want here are important topics that aren't being addressed somewhere else, and that's something we always think about on the Education Committee. Is there another website, another resource that, that's providing this information? And typically, no. I haven't found a lot of things out there on Jacksonian democracy. Um, and are we providing a new way to look at these um, topics? And so I think that looking at Jackson here, you can see <clears throat> One thing I focused on in the first question is this idea of presidential vetoes. And so for our students, you know, that's something we can even tie to the modern day. And I, and I think that's important as well, is taking these historical questions and, and you've, you've got a basis, you've got five questions here. So if you have the students explore, you have discussion questions, you can build on these discussion questions and take them forward. You can take them backwards and say, where have we seen vetoes previously? So I, I feel like what we've created um, is a good template for teachers to start with. Um, I, I've always heard, you know, the best things in education aren't um, things that you've spent, you know, weeks preparing. It's things that you've borrowed and, and shared and tweaked and made your own. And, you know, my, my lesson today, I've been using it so long, I can't remember if I'm the one that created it or if I borrowed it from somebody else. And I hope that you feel that way about the DPLA sets, that these sets become part of your everyday teaching style. They become part of your go-to place um, in teaching. And so, I mean, sometimes we're inundated with resources, but I feel like what we're creating here, the 100 sets that we're creating here, are going to be your go-to place when you're trying to come up with something for American history, if you're trying to come up with something um, for literature, and that's something that Melissa is going to talk about is how these can be used in literature. And that's, I think, important because, you know, most of the historical questions I get in my emails are from my English teachers because my English teachers are teaching primary sources just as much as my social studies are teachers are teaching primary sources in, in our school. And so, uh, as Frankie said earlier, context, 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 that's very important. Um, and, and I think that what we've tried to do with the overview is to provide some of that context. We've chosen the important sections with these excerpts for kids to start thinking about, um, you know, the focus instead of inundating them with too much information, we're, in, we're hitting them with what we really want them to know, the heart of it. As, as one of my college professors used to call it, the money quote, what, what, what can you cash all the way to the bank? What is the core of what's trying to be accomplished? And so I feel like these documents um, achieve that. Um, and, and again, this is not us telling you one way to use these documents. I'm telling you a way that I think that they are able to be used and to get you thinking about how to incorporate them in your classroom. And I'll pass it back to Ms. Frankie. Thank you so much, Adina. That's terrific. Okay. <laughs> um, and we will now put you on hold until we get some questions at the end. Um, and now um, we're going to hear a little bit from Melissa Strong. Hi everybody. Um, I guess I'm the, the peanut butter <laughs> in the uh, in the sandwich. Um, 
I share uh, Adina's reasons for applying for um, a position on the Education Advisory Committee, and she's right, there's so much overlap between English and language arts and history and social studies, and oftentimes um, folks who are teaching American literature and American history are assigning the same texts. And there's also been a movement towards uh, periodization, particularly at the college level, where um, the approach to teaching American literature uh, these days is almost more like art history um, than a literature class was when I was in college. So there's this real emphasis on the widely used anthologies in situating texts within their cultural context. So in order to, to read Langston Hughes's poetry, for instance, and, and really um, be able to analyze it, we have to know what was going on at the time around him, both within the context of the Harlem Renaissance and within the country at large. So um, I've been at NSU for, um, for six years. I'm an associate professor of English. Um, I coordinate the master's program in English. And um, a lot of our, our majors in the, the bachelor's program are English ed. Um, and um, uh, like Adina, I have involvement with uh, with AP. I've been an AP English literature reader for um, a number of years. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. So um, this semester, I was inspired by um, my work with the the Education Advisory Committee and and the source sets that I created. Um, with the examples that, that we just saw um, from Adina's, one of Adina's sets, to um, incorporate these kinds of processes into a survey class in American literature, which is required both for English majors and English ed students. And so I called this a digital humanities project, and essentially the students um, created their own source sets, um, very similarly to, uh, to the ones um, to, to the sets that, that the committee members and, and DPLA staff created. And um, my reason for this, um, again, you know, to, to echo what Adina said, um, this type of assignment, these kinds of assessments really emphasize higher order thinking. So um, they really challenge students' skills and analysis. And then also from the, the perspective of um, uh, literature and helping students to develop their, their critical thinking and, and um, analytical skills, it, the assignment resists this, this myth of like the one correct answer. You know, so um, I'm a, a, an instructor who believes that there are multiple valid ways to interpret the text. I mean, they have to be re replicable. It has to be like the scientific method. Someone else has to be able to come up with and justify the same hypothesis. But um, I, I'd never insist on, on one correct way to read a text, and so um, this is a way in which to, to show that there are multiple ways to approach a text and that situating them within their cultural and historical context will um, enrich understanding. I also like um, that, that this type of activity engages students. It's a way to promote active learning. It's hands-on. It's peer-to-peer -peer learning. And um, primary sources really bring the past to life, and they bring literary texts to life um, for students. So I prepared this assignment, and I, um, I gave them um, uh, some information about digital humanities. Um, a lot of folks believe that digital humanities is the future of, um, of the humanities and, and possibly even a savior in this era of budget cuts and increasing questions about the value of anything essentially that's not STEM related, um, you know, and, and pressure to justify soft skills or, you know, what can you do with an English major and, and that kind of thing. So I provided um, students with, with information such as this quote from Russell Berman, who's a former president of the MLA, to help them understand what, why we're doing this. So um, in addition to creating source sets, um, students had to review and uh, comment in writing on their classmates' assignments. And then they wrote reflection essays um, talking about their, their, their own processes, what they thought of their classmates' work, and then um, just responding to the assignment, what they saw as, as the pros and cons. And um, I'll share with you some quotes from those a little bit later. So um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, so I talked about a little bit of these things already. Um, 
the um, the other thing that I'd like to mention is is the way that an assignment like this um, engages with critical pedagogy. So it helps students to see and be aware of the role that institutions like um, education, higher education, textbooks, museums play in shaping um, history and cultural memory, including um, the history of literature and the arts. And um, I, on the assignment that I provided, I, I listed these uh, learning outcomes, specific learning outcomes, um, to help students recognize ahead of time what they were getting out of it and to see the method to the madness. Next slide, please. Okay, and so here are some of the, the quotes, and I, I have more to share, and so if, there's, um, if there are questions at the end or people would like to hear more, I'd, I'd be glad to share it. But, but you can see, essentially, that the responses were overwhelmingly positive, and I, I just kind of picked some representative quotes. Um, the one about the, the thrift shop for humanities nerds was probably the most amusing, but, but overall, um, you know, the students did have some difficulty, and, and they recognized that, um, you know, DPLA doesn't work like Google, and so uh, we did spend some time in class um, talking about how to search, and then I provided some tutorials and also some sample source sets, but that didn't quite seem to be enough, and this was a, a junior um, undergraduate level class, and students needed a little bit more help. Um, one pointed out that, um, students who were experienced with um, electronic databases or primary sources um, probably would have an easy time, but um, others, you know, might, might struggle to, to make connections between sources and content, and certainly some of them did. Um, a lot of them picked really great primary sources, but um, weren't, their, their projects weren't as effective in connecting the primary sources with the literary text, but, but others completely got it and, and hit it out of the park. And in particular, the English ed students really saw this as valuable. Um, you know, they, they were really jazzed about it. They were able to see how what they were, the content that they were learning in this American literature class was something uh, that they could transfer into their own classrooms. It, it really um, reinvigorated their desire um, to be teachers, um, and then they they appreciated learning about the DPLA. Most of them had never heard of it before, and then you know here they are with their sleeves rolled up, um, uh, getting their their um, hands into it, and they recognized well that um, that these primary sources were a way to deepen their understanding of specific texts. So there was one student who. Um, uh, did a source set on a poem by Sylvia, Sylvia Plath, and she, she really felt like she learned in um, more about Plath and, and the particular poem in creating um, this content related to it. Another student did a poem by uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, um, and uh, she thought that, that uh, she got to see this poem from more angles. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about a textual analysis in class, but, but it really deepened her understanding of, um, of context. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, that's uh, also really excellent and helpful, and we will come back to you at the end. Um, and I'm actually, so we have lots of time for questions, just going to... Um, whiz through a final few slides about the education project. Um, as I think you heard Adina reference the 100 sets, um, the mission and goal of the Education Advisory Committee is to have um, created 70 sets in addition to the 30 that we've already published, which is pretty exciting. So by May 2016, there will be 100 sets uh, up on the DPLA's website. Uh, and including, uh, we also are hoping over the course of time to build out the sets project with some new features. So obviously when we get um, much north of 30 sets, we will need some tools with which to help people navigate the set collection itself to find the things that they want, the ability, for example, to filter by um, subject and or um, time period. We also are moving ahead um, trying to give users the opportunity to generate their own sets, so to actually make make uh, a tool that would enable people um, to do on the DPLA's website some of the fabulous work that Melissa did with her students, um, being able to generate sets as assignments, and of course to, to be uh, allowing educators of, 
of any kind to be able to um, create sets on the site and not just use the sort of authorized ones that the committee's made. Um, we do currently have a save and share list feature that you can access in the top right corner of the website uh, where you're given the option to log in or register. Those are, by the way, the only reasons that you would register uh, for the DPLA because otherwise it's just a searchable website and there's no subscription. But you can right now um, save items to a list. But we hope to improve that feature um, so that it allows people to really create useful uh, sets or collections of materials, um, teachers and students. And of course, the DPLA will um, move ahead, uh, continuing to find further funding for the project because we want to continue to engage um, teachers in general and maybe even this committee specifically because they've been so fabulous if they're interested in having us. Um, just a few more DPLA education related projects. Uh, DPLA has a great collection of about 30 exhibitions up on the site. Uh, they are not specifically made um, as education resources, so they don't have the same kinds of exciting questions and activities associated with them, and they were not designed necessarily by teachers. But nonetheless, um, some of them have, I think, uh, some education value. Here's an example of uh, an exhibition about World War One that has uh, seven different chapters. The level of um, curation here is um, much heavier, so there's a lot more um, writing, but similarly a sort of pairing of some description with primary sources, which is exciting. That's, I love this poster, um, Save the Products of the Land. Um, but again, you know, these are uh, posters on this particular page um, related to uh, food waste campaigns during World War I. So the exhibitions can provide a useful sort of narrative structure for students to use should they want to research a topic. The DPLA is also engaged in um, some broader education partnerships. So uh, it's important to us not just to collect partner content and make open education resources on our own website, but we're also sharing the primary sources in the DPLA with other education projects. Um, we share content uh, like the sets and exhibitions with the Learning Registry, which if you're not familiar is a project of the Department of Education that then um, gives state and other uh, open education resource websites the ability to pull um, content from places like the DPLA onto their website and make it accessible to their teachers. We are also um, starting to share a small amounts of content with PBS Learning Media, which is an exciting partnership. And we do provide research guides um, for as students involved in National History Day, uh, showing them what they might find in the DPLA for national and more local topics. The DPLA is also partnering with uh, the New York Public Library and First Books to work on the Open eBooks Initiative, which provides um, a collection of uh, public domain and other uh, licensed eBooks to um, students from low-income backgrounds measured by free and reduced lunch status. That project is exciting and should be launching um, in the next several months, so be on the lookout for that. In the future, uh, the DPLA is a project with a very ambitious and very broad uh, collection mission. So right now we work primarily with cultural heritage materials, which means a lot of great opportunities with primary sources and some secondary sources. But the DPLA will be growing uh, to include, as I mentioned already, cultural heritage content from um, many, uh, if not hopefully all states in the US. Um, we hope to broaden on the site our collection of eBooks to um, do exploratory projects with newspapers and perhaps um, to also build some capacity for the kinds of content that would serve users outside the world of humanities. So um, data sets for science and social science researchers and more. I love, by the way, this um, Buck Rogers special spaceship um, picture courtesy of the National Air and Space Museum. This is, if I could capture the future in a, in a picture, this is what that picture would look like. So we hope uh, as the DPLA grows its collection that we will continue to find innovative ways to bring those resources to um, educators in the way that we have started to do with our fabulous committee. We also are at a stage um, where we are very eager to hear from folks who are using DPLA in the classroom, who are using the sets, which are pretty brand new, uh, and there's lots of ways to get in touch with us. Um, I already mentioned dp.la slash education, which gives um, some point of access to all the things we've talked about here. Um, we also do have an education-specific email list where you can get ed education announcements from the organization when we, for example, publish new groups of primary source sets. Um, we have an education email address, which we welcome uh, feedback, positive and negative at, which is education at dp.la. And we also do um, supply people with a free newly designed classroom posters who write an email and ask, and swag, stickers, pencils, pens. Uh, if we get an email and you can describe a specific use for the swag, we're happy to shoulder the cost and burden of mailing it to you because we appreciate your efforts to help us spread the word um, to students and teachers across the country. 
So finally, um, I want to get Kenny's help um, taking your questions, um, but I put some contact information on this final slide for all three of the presenters, and I just want to say thank you again to um, Adina and Melissa for representing the committee and the DPLA so nicely. Hey everyone, this is Kenny from DPLA. Um, if you have questions for our presenters, please feel free to enter them into the um, questions or chat uh, function and we can uh, get those answered. Okay. Um, looks like we have one question here um, from Esther. Uh, are there sets or collections that relate to or partner with open education and open educational resources? Um, I'm not actually totally sure that I completely understand that question. Um, so I guess I think uh, this is probably not the answer uh, to, the, to the question, Esther, that you might be asking, but um, the material in the sets is adaptable and reusable in other places. So for example, it's possible that it could be used in an open textbook project um, where the, the, the rights permit that to happen. We don't yet have any formal relationships um, with uh, other open educational resources, although like I said, um, we are sharing the sets through the learning registry so they will be accessible through OER um, collection websites. Um, I had a question from Matt who asks, will you be making this webinar slide available with the audio? Um, yes, we have recorded the webinar and we'll be processing that um, later this evening and first thing tomorrow and should have it up on our site um, by the end of the week at the latest. And um, Frankie, do, do you plan to send that out over the education news list? Um, when yes. that's ready? Okay. That will be an education specific uh, announcement. So we'll let you know when it's up and send a link to the page it will live on and then um, feel free to watch it, share it. Um, great. One question here from um, Trish who asked, what is the status of the set creation tool? Uh, the status of the set creation tool is that it is um, right now <clears throat> in negotiation between the DPLA's tech team uh, and the education unit, but we are um, hoping to have put something up early in 2016. Um, so it's uh, after launching the sets themselves, which of course took some um, database creation and other things on the back end, it is the sort of next big priority. Um, so it's it's on schedule to be released before the end of this particular grant, which will be great. Okay, we got a, we got a, a few more that came in while you're answering that question, Frankie. Um, the first is, will there be more sets geared towards grades six through eight? These are adaptable, but I was hoping for some literature sets that would meet our needs in middle school. Um, yes, I think uh, you will see in the next round, perhaps um, one or two new sets that are middle school literature. I'm also totally uh, interested, I'm not sure actually who asked that question because I'm having trouble following along. Was that C Candace? Kenny? Um, it was Mary, I believe. Oh, Mary. Uh, Mary, uh, you are a special insider DPLA community rep, I believe, and so if you have um, suggestions for us about particular works of literature for six through eight that you would like us to write sets about. We are quite eager for suggestions, so please just write me an email, and I'm happy to throw your suggestions into the pool um, of the great negotiation about what the sets will be about with the folks, including Melissa, who work on the sort of literature end of the set development. Great. Um, next question is from John Heffernan. He asks, are there plans to create sets according to breakdown syllabus? Um, I'm actually not 
not sure that I know what that question, is that a phrase, um, Melissa or Adina, that is resonant with you? I'm not sure what that means, I don't think. I don't either. No. John, if, if, you, if you're, uh, you could, uh, you know, expand on that a little bit, we can, we can circle back to your question. Um, there are quite a few now, actually. So the next one um, is about images. Are the images, uh, I'm going to assume, it's, the question is, are images copyrighted? Um, so I'm guessing that refers to the images used in the, um, the primary source sets. Um, well, that's a good, um, that's an excellent question. I see that one is actually by Candace. So sorry, um, Candace, that I confused that question with the other one. Um, so uh, from many of the images, so to learn about the right status of an item, um, you can follow that link that we showed that says view this item in the DPLA, and then you can see what the institution claims as its official right status. Um, if you are making an education, non-commercial use uh, of the items in the sets, um, I don't really think that you need to worry. If you are interested in selecting a particular um, image from a set that might not be in the public domain and you want to, you know, silk screen it on some um, t-shirts and sell those t-shirts, then maybe we might have a problem. But if it's a question of incorporating it into a student project um, or other clear education use, I think that you're probably fine. But um, it is true that the items in the sets have a range of copyright statuses. So many, many, many of them are in the public domain, but there are a few um, of the items that are under copyright um, to someone. So you can find more information by clicking on that view this item in the DPLA link. Um, <clears throat> the next question is from uh, Blake Holman. Will user-created sets be private to the creators or searchable publicly? Um, that's an excellent question, Blake. I think we hope um, to offer both options. So if people would like to make a set public, they can make that set public, although um, I, it will look somewhat different than the sets um, as you see them now. So it won't necessarily automatically become part of the collection of primary source sets that the committee's made, um, that it will be able to you know, generate a link, for example, that could be shared publicly, um, or it could be um, marked private, in which case other people would not be able to find it. Thanks, Frankie. Um, the next question is from Melva uh, Acevedo. She asks, does DPLA provide workshops to higher education faculty and librarians on how to use the resources? Um, are there face-to-face -face, uh, uh, presentations within the state of Massachusetts or online? Ooh, well, um, Melva, anything's possible because I am in your state. <laughs> so I am in Massachusetts, which is a major advantage, but uh, I should mention we have a goodly number of DPLA community reps on the call, and um, a good number of them are folks who work in higher education, so we actually have a network of people um, that might, uh, if the schedules allow, include some of the committee members who might be willing to make um, a visit to um, an institution and do a workshop, again, depending on where the school is. So that would be something that would be great. Um, to write me an email about at education at dp.la um, and likely particularly if you're in Massachusetts um, we could make that happen. Great so we, it looks like we have three more questions and I think we have three more minutes left in the hour so I think we can get through these. Um, we've got one from Shirley who asked are, are any of your teachers working in arts and literacy integration programs? Um, I actually think so we do not have any on our committee um, arts teachers formally, although we do have a couple of um, administrators that work on curriculum integration with literacy projects. So I mean, if the question is about, you know, do we have a music teacher or a visual art teacher? No, um, but we do have some folks who are dealing with those issues at a sort of higher administrative level. Um, Next question is from Beth, who asks, um, will the set creator exhibit uh, be on your site, or is it offline for institutions who may use it in the classroom? Oh, Beth just said that that was already answered. So moving on, sorry about that. <laughs> Next question is from Matt, and he asks, um, have there been discussions about making other tools for working with DPLA stuff that would extend beyond the primary source sets and lessons plans? such as things in the vein of tools on docsteach.org. 
Um, so I assume, Matt, that this is a question about like creating specific activities. Um, so uh, docsteach.org, for those who are not familiar, um, allows you to create um, a an activity. So you sort of select content and then you select a skill that you're looking to test. Um, I think actually what's interesting is you will probably see some changes to docsteach um, in the next few months, because I, uh, as part of our education research project, have chatted with them some. Um, we don't actually, at this point, have plans to create um, tools around specific skills. I think for us, given the resources that we have at this point, um, the best approach is probably the sets, but uh, who can say, depending on the amount of funding that we find for the education project um, and the needs that are expressed to us by teachers. I think that does it for the questions. I don't, we don't have any more. Um, I wanted to give a chance for Adina and Melissa to just give a final comment because I just answered a, a bunch of questions that were specifically sort of programmatic, but um, anything that the two of you wanted to say? Sure, this is Melissa and I would say that, that um, I have found the process of, of working on my source sets and um, the related educational content to be tremendously interesting and professionally rewarding. I mean, obviously so much so that I was inspired to bring it to my students and I found that, that it had the same um, effect and impact on them and I would really encourage other people to, to try giving it a shot. Thank you so much. Um, well, it sounds like, uh, it's, I know it's 8.02 so we should let people um, get back to their evening or afternoon, depending what time zone you're in. Um, but thank you so much for joining us for this webinar, and we will, uh, if you're on the education list, inform you of the recording once it's up. And thanks so much to Adina and Melissa for sharing their experiences with us.